こんにちはオキロフェイシャルクリニック東京院長の鹿島智之です海外の先生を招いて海外の知見を日本のドクターに向けて講演していただくというインターナショナルレクチャーズの第2回目になります今回のインターナショナルレクチャーズはジョンス・ホップキンス大学からニコラス・マホーニー先生に最新の 3D 技術を使った眼科手術と眼検下水についてご講演してもらいますアメリカと日本の眼形成の世界の違いを知っていただけたらと思いますそれではマホニー先生よろしくお願いいたしますどうも。
this is not my patient, but it can be a disaster. In this case, they resected too much skin. They did too much elevating. They resected skin on the bottom. They didn't actually tighten his horizontal laxity appropriately. It's a disaster. And it can be relative. Uh, this is a post-op of mine. I did a right-sided mullerectomy and, uh, I'm sorry, left-sided mullerectomy at the time of an upper eyelid and lower eyelid blepharoplasty, and she was miserable and required five revision surgeries to get a result that I think looks just as good as the, the first time around. Um, I looked at my own practice. My revision rate is around 6.8%. Uh, I take a patient either back to the operating room or do a little adjustment in the clinic. Relatively small uh, number of things, but when you do a lot of surgery, this is a real number. And I tell my patients that revisions is uh, not rare, something that needs to happen. Uh, some reasons why we need to do revisions. Here's a patient who we did a blepharoplasty on who probably should have had a ptosis repair. So incorrectly identified that there was a pre-existing ptosis. Here's a patient I did a right ptosis repair on who actually had some enhancement on the left side. So failure to pick up uh, enhancement. Um, this is a patient I, I selected because I'm not sure whether or not you guys experience this, but we have a lot of patients, particularly where I practice, that are of Korean ethnicity who have brow tattoos and the tattoos are very, very high, much higher than the natural position. Uh, we don't have a lot of Asian patients in my practice. And so this is something that we, a little bit of a learning on how to get that lateral skin hooding lifted without creating too long of a scar um, for these patients. One of the most interesting failure reasons that I've got a particular passion on is this phenomenon of horizontal laxity. So these patients all have ptosis but you'll notice their lashes is pointing down. There's a little bit of an S shape. It gets more profound as these go. And these patients have very, very profound laxity of the tissues. Probably the tarsal plate is a bit um, uh, malleable, uh, maybe a bit elongated as well. And we call this floppy eyelid syndrome, but you see some degree of this with mild ptosis as well. Uh, here's a gentleman who has the downturn lashes, a little bit less of the S shape, but if you grab his lid, it just feels like it's not gonna lift well. One of the problems we have when we're doing that adjustable contour shaping, if the lid is horizontally loose, the contour responds very dramatically to adjusting those sutures. And it's because they have not only the levator tendon dehiscence, but the tarsus is abnormal and the cantal tendons are abnormal. And you can't fix all of these things, but what I've come to do more commonly is to do a very small upper eyelid miniature tarsal tightening procedure at the time of our levator advancement which I find to be a very effective way to get a nice lift. I can get a very profound elevation of the contour. Uh, we keep it pretty tight for these patients because with time, this is a very common reason to dehiss. This is an example of uh, the patient that I'll bring this procedure to more commonly. There's not frank floppy eyelid. This is just an older woman who has dehiscent cantal tendons, a little bit of phimosis. Maybe the lashes are down a bit, but it's really just ptosis but she's loose. The upper lid, the lower lid are very, very loose. And I think it's a neglected problem that I like to treat. If you really think about it, if, if the lid is loose and you're trying to set the tension of the lid, um, or the height of the lid, like I mentioned, these contour problems, if you put one suture in and another suture in, you'll get this sort of abnormal contour if it's loose. But if you tighten it horizontally, just one stitch, you get a nice smooth contour. So that's really the, the sort of idea. This is this particular patient. And really anybody where, where they go to blink, and the upper eyelid goes over the lower eyelid is someone who I find to be a candidate for this. I make a little tiny cantal incision here. I do a partial canthotomy, just a bit of an anterior canthotomy, excise a little bit of the lid margin and undermine the corner just a touch. And this exposes the lateral tarsal plate, but I don't do a full tarsal strip because I don't want to get into those lacrimal gland ductules and violate any of the flow of the gland. The uh, I just use a blunt dissection to expose the rim a little bit. Maybe I cut down through some of the muscle tissue to the rim. And then I'll use uh, 5-0 poly, uh, PDS, uh, suture in a double-armed manner, partial thickness in the tarsal plate, and two passes. And then I'll put this usually at around the level of the pupil, maybe a little bit lower than the pupil, into the lateral orbital rim. Yeah, I like to close the cantal angle with a 6-0 monocryl suture. And when I place this, I actually go into the lid margin. So it's, it's actually an exposed suture. Um, but I find it's, it's nice and secure. And I'll tie this in that same temporary bow knot. Then I'll do my ptosis repair, which I showed you another patient previously, but you can see here nicely, the fat is out of the way. The septum is, is pretty wide open. I grab the white part of the tendon. I like to go underneath the, the tendon between tendon and Mueller's. I put my, my two stitches on each side and then she's sitting up 
you can see a very dramatic elongation appearance of the eyelid during the surgery, but I'm, I very much like this technique. And you can see, you know, this is a few different patients for um, the results. We get very, very profound changes in the eyelid. In this case, it was actually a little too much. This gentleman ended up a bit high, which we found to be the biggest problem with this particular surgery is that patients end up pretty high. Now, worth mentioning, in some cases, you don't even need to do anything but horizontal tightening. In this particular case, all I did was wedge resections. I didn't even do anything to lift the lid. Uh, I think if we're going to do a wedge resection, we'll often get a little bit of elevation of the lid. I don't think you can go up as easily with a tarsal strip of the upper lid. Now, I, I like that tarsal tightening procedure I mentioned, but I, I'm almost always going to do that with the levator advancement if they're totic in my, my patient population. Um, for congenital, there's a couple of different subtypes of congenital. It might just be that the levator is malformed or it could be dehiscent from something during birth. But in general, it's different than adult ptosis. We see a lot of patients with this, and I use this nomogram, which is 40, 50 years old at this point. Uh, this is freely available online, but I, I like to use this nomogram to, to set my, my height of the lid because these patients are under general. And it, you know, two and a half centimeters of lifting is a lot you feel like you're really tightening these children. You have to do some back cuts on either side. I like to do a separate tightening of the conjunctiva because the conjunctiva will fold up, so I'll actually cut conjunctiva. So I guess they're technically getting a conjunctiva as well. And then I do full thickness sutures to recreate the lid crease that go all the way through. I'm not sure if you see blepharophimosis here. Blepharophimosis is a subtype of, of the congenital ptosis. And there's a variety of different, this is just me drawing this on the whiteboard. It's the only picture I could pull for this, this talk at the, at the minute. But I like to do a combination of the Fuente del Campo and sort of the, the, the Anderson technique. So number one and number three. Anderson modified the sort of Mustardi um, uh, man. I think people call it the Mustardi stick man um, for the epicanthal fold. And I, I do something that's a little bit more like what's on the bottom there. And this is a patient that we did this on. And generally speaking, I find you can get pretty good elongation of the medial canthus and um, lifting of the, of the uh, medial canthal, the, uh, dropping of the medial canthal fold. So a um, couple more slides and then I'll wrap up. Just this, this talk has lots of things in it, but I, I don't think I'm going to have time to get through everything. So when we're doing uh, upper lid surgery beyond the ptosis element, I think there's a few features that we can mess up on some of the associated elements. The blepharoplasty, for instance. Here's a couple of patients who had just nice blepharoplasties. Generally, I like to remove a, a sort of strip of skin. I don't usually remove muscle, orbicularis muscle. Um, I know in Asian patients, we find a little bit more um, uh, volume and it can be helpful to remove orbicularis, but our patient population is a little bit more sulcus sunken and has a lot of dry eye and things, so we try to spare it if we can. This is a pretty good example of the type of mark that I use. I don't usually do pinch testing. I just sort of move the lid up and down. I do like to take a caliper and measure that the brow is the right height that, that I think uh, you know, this is equal sort of um, all the way across. And in general, my, my mark is around nine millimeters in, in most patients. Uh, I think the most common problem I see is dehiscent wounds from this type of a closure. If we're doing our closure, we have to make sure that we get fully through the skin edges. If you have anything that's only partially through, you'll end up with little tucking of the actual epidermal edge. Uh, I think this is a problem unique to Caucasian patients. We have very, very thin skinned patients and the skin will roll very easily. And our, our trainees or our colleagues in other fields that are less dedicated to the eyelid will sometimes end up with a problem here. I think one of the things that's also important to, to consider with these surgeries is what happens to the eyebrow. So here's a patient with profound frontalis use. We did a ptosis repair and the brow has come down. She's disappointed because her, she feels like her brow has got lower during surgery. And I think the eyebrow is the other domain of eyelid surgery we need to remember. All different patients with profound eyebrow ptosis and you can kind of look at their foreheads and figure out what, what type of surgeries would I want to do for them. I like to tell patients there are nine different options, which means none of them is perfect. If it was one that was perfect, we would do it for all of the patients. Really, the problem is it either doesn't last, it's difficult for me and the patient, or it leaves a visible scar someplace. And uh, I started out being afraid of the visible scar and trying these more exotic techniques, but I've become less afraid of the scar. I think if you learn to close the scar uh, as well as possible, you can get a pretty nice result. 
This is a patient with a direct brow plasty, exactly like I mentioned, we have that scar. I, I, this is what's in textbooks. My mark, uh, I usually try to make a little different to avoid this peaking phenomenon. And in fact, if you sort of break out the different types of surgeries, you can kind of see that you get the most profound lateral contour shift with a direct brow plasty. So I usually call this a gull wing uh, incision. I, I make my mark something like this. This is a gentleman and this is what his scar looks like at three months. I do a 5.0 vicral deep closure with a 6.0 monocryl subcuticular and then 5.0 chromic uh, vertical mattress sutures is how I do my closure. Uh, this is a, um, that gentleman, another gentleman with a direct brow. Sometimes you can see a bit of a depression if they're a more meaty patient. I showed this patient earlier, something I do uh, occasionally for these patients is actually excise the brow tattoo and then I'll have them go get a new tattoo on top of the scar. I'm not sure this is a great technique, but it's what I did for that lady. The mid forehead is another um, way of doing a direct brow. Rather than being right here, we go up high and you can see in this particular patient, patient it allows you to get that medial brow lifted. It looks fairly terrible for three months. They have a very, very profound looking scar, but it does heal eventually. And then the pretracheal approach. So this woman had many, many folds of her forehead and a very high lid crease and so, a very high a forehead uh, hairline. So we went ahead and did a pretracheal approach and you can excise actual skin for, her for that. The endoscopic lift, you know, pretty, pretty well established and the, the pearls for that particular one. I'll just mention that the fixation thing that I like to use is the, the calvarial tunnel. So for those not familiar with it, you have this device that keeps your um, drill at a slight angle and prevents you from going too deep. So it'll only go through the first um, cortical bone layer. And then it has this small hook that you can kind of pass directly through. And because it's at the exact same angle as the hook, it's fairly easy to just thread it through there. You put your suture onto that hook and then you can fixate to, to that. Um, I guess I have these two videos backwards. This is the actual technique of the drilling. So it has a little stop. It prevents you from going too deep. And then you put a little plug into it so that it keeps that sort of angle positioned correctly while you then drill the other side. And uh, this is a gentleman with an endoscopic lift. I like to do that fixation with the tunnels and then I'll use to seal glue underneath the bone flap, underneath the, the skin flap. Um, I think all of these techniques work pretty well. Internal brow pexy does not last quite as long, but almost 80% of my blepharoplasties get an internal brow pexy. And some people call this a brassiere suture. I think there's a lot of variations, but I think it's really important to manage the subbrow fat. Uh, somehow. So I like to suspend it to the rim. Uh, this is an example of a gentleman who probably should have had a more formal brow lift, but this is all we can convince him to do. And we can get a little bit of support of that lateral brow, make our blepharoplasty incision. I like to use a Stephen scissors to spread the tissues. While you're in there, you can also excise a bit of the corrugators to get a little bit of a lift on the medial brow. This is a woman with a blepharoplasty and a medial corrugator release, which works pretty well for, for most patients. The external brow pexy, not something I do too much, but might be a, a, another option. I think Guy Massery published this. These are his pictures. And it, it, it works fairly well in, in an older patient where you're trying to do something quick and simple. But as I mentioned, there's no perfect solution for the brow. You sort of have a, a variety of different techniques, but all of them have some downside. So you kind of pick which of the downsides would be best for your particular, your particular patient. So I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, I do get into the lower lid a little bit, but I think we've covered the upper lid pretty well. Maybe some other time we'll talk about the lower lid. I'll say thanks again for having me and for listening to these talks.